This is the All Elite Wrestling Podcast. It's called All Elite Wrestling Unrestricted, the official podcast of AEW. You're real excited about this. I really am. How how you've been stuck at home, so you're probably like real desperate for attention. Yes, right I'm now. stuck. I'm real I'm real desperate for content. I'm real desperate <laughs> for for contact, human contact. And by the way, Tony Shivani, Aubrey Edwards. Hey. Your co-host. And boy, are we excited today. And, and we always say that. Uh, but we really are every time. But I'm really more excited because uh, we're going to be talking to one of my colleagues and a young man who I consider uh, the, uh, the next generation of announcers in pro wrestling. He's the man. Excalibur. Hey, Excalibur. How are you? Hey, guys? what's going on? Hey, guys. It's, uh, it's great to be talking with you. It's, we, we went from speaking almost constantly to never speaking in, in a matter of a month. So yeah. isn't, that, isn't that something? Yeah. I don't think I've seen you in person for like uh, Salt Lake City. Weeks. No, Jackson. Salt Lake City. First first Jackson. Jackson. Yeah, the first week in Jacksonville. Yeah, right. it's been wild. The first week at the undisclosed location in, undisclosed in location, northern Florida. Right. Nobody tell Jeff Jones to listen to this. He'll get mad. <laughs> oh, does he still get mad about things like well? Jeff Jones gets yep. mad about everything. Everything. Does the exactly. Pope shit in the woods, Tony? <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, hi. Uh, oh. So Excalibur, you're incredible commentator for AEW, but a lot of people don't know that you're also commentator and one of the original founders of PWG, Pro Wrestling Guerrilla, one of the biggest indie promotions in wrestling. Um, yes, I, I. And what people also don't know, and this, you know, somewhat by design, is that I used to be a professional wrestler as well. I wasn't a highly regarded professional wrestler, but I made, I had a, a lot of friends that were highly regarded professional wrestlers, and so I sort of glommed on to them. And uh, we started Pro Wrestling Gorilla in 2003, and myself and five other guys, just independent wrestlers in Southern California, uh, Super Dragon, Disco Machine. Mr. Excitement, Top Gun, Talbor, and Scott Lost and Joey Ryan were the, the original six people that started PWG. And we were just kind of sick of, you know, there was a lot of shady indie promoters back then. This was kind of in the, the early days of the internet when word didn't travel quite as quickly. And so guys could, you know, rip people off. And we, you know, we were kind of sick of that. And we, we saw that we were going out there and kind of busting our asses and having, you know, what we considered to be really great matches. And, you know, they're for promoters that weren't necessarily that thankful for it. And uh, so we just decided, why not try it, do it ourselves? And so we all got a couple bucks together and we did our first show back in July of 2003. The main event was Frankie Kazarian versus AJ Styles. And, Damn. Uh, wow. Yeah, and that was kind of where where Pro Wrestling Gorilla all started, and that's also the start of my commentary career as well. Yeah. So you wrestled for how long before switching to commentary? I wrestled for about seven years, from '99 to 2006, and I started doing commentary in 2003 for that first PWG show. I had done I done a little bit of, of commentary before that for uh you know some other socal promotions but pwg was really where i got started and it was pretty much it was out of necessity because those first shows we were charging 15 bucks a ticket and we had maybe 100 people there and so when you have frank kazarian and aj styles in in your main event there's you know airfare and pay and all these other things to worry about we had to pay for the venue all this stuff and so we had to release the shows on well, at the time vhs and DVD. Oh boy! Hmm. And uh, just out of total necessity, I uh, myself and Disco Machine we did did commentary on those uh, those shows, and uh, that was kind of where where it got rolling. And I've done I think every PWG show except for one of them. What was the one? I don't remember. <laughs> I think it might have been one of the European shows. Ah, interesting. Uh, who came up with the name Pro Wrestling Gorilla? I think it was me. But it was, uh, <laughs> you know, this was 17 years ago. Take the credit. It's fine. No one remembers. It's a, I say that because it's really a, it's a cool name. Well, so it, it actually started out as a joke because there was a, a promoter in Southern California that he was, a, you know, to use the, the inside baseball term, a money mark. And he said that, you know, indie wrestling is, uh, is pro wrestling at its most gorilla. And we all kind of laughed at that because... He just kind of came in with, you know, his checkbook and that. And so sure. 
it was it was a name that that amused us, but then I also really liked to be able to use the pun of having a gorilla as our as our mascot. So that was right. It served two masters. Right, I get that. So tell us about how the mask came into thing into being for you. What's the significance of the mask? Well, I was I was into wrestling as a kid. You know, uh, Hulk Hogan, Macho Man, those kind of stuff. Ultimate Warrior, and then. In the early 90s, I, I got out of it. I'm not sure what it was, but that just kind of, you know, like, I guess just part of growing up, your, your friends are into different things. I started getting into basketball. And, but then in about 96, a friend of mine showed me a copy of the WCW When Worlds Collide and uh, mm. the pay-per-view with, you know, that had, uh, oh, shit, what was the match? It was uh, Negro Casas and Octagon versus uh, Art Bar and Eddie Guerrero. And, wow. you know, it was, it was just, you know, it was, a, it was like basically like a kind of a WCW versus a uh, AAA right. pay-per-view. And I was just like, oh my God, this is amazing. And right around that time, Nitro was about to start. Uh, I think the, the Pillman and Liger match had happened. The first one happened, you know, like a year or so before that. I saw that on videotape and I just started, I became enthralled with, with Japanese wrestling. And, you know, because I, I, I loved the aesthetics of Lucha Libre, but the athleticism of the Japanese style. And then when I discovered the Japanese junior heavyweight style that was kind of pioneered by Grant Hamada with UWF, which would then turn out guys like Great Sasuke, Ultimo Dragon, all those guys started in Hamada's UWF in Japan. And that kind of was the precursor for Michinoku Pro, which, was the, you know, that was also right around the same time that Liger and all those guys in New Japan were kind of pioneering that junior heavyweight style. And that was something that I really, I really found myself drawn toward. And so I was always a big fan of superhero comics growing up. And so to be able to have a kind of masked superhero persona, but with actual in-ring superheroic feats of athleticism, that checked both of those boxes for me and that kind of drew me in and so the guy that i was most drawn to at that time was great sasuke and so my mask is kind of a homage to to his style i've got the you know like the tassels the black mask with the white faceplate, but then also like the the crest on the top of the mask is an homage to black bolt from the immortals and uh marvel comics and so That's awesome. you know it's uh kind of marrying both of those those two passions of mine as a younger person together and you know here I am all these 25 plus years later still wearing this mask and sweating constantly <laughs> yes and it's got to be tough to see through as well it is to yeah read, uh, to read a format <laughs> luckily uh you know luckily when we're doing our show I've got a monitor about arms arms length from me um but when I'm doing PWG shows, you know, I've, I've got the lights in my face, the, the screens on the mask. And so I'm kind of just seeing shapes that are moving and, and you know, giving my best guess of, of what they're doing. And, you know, and I'd say about I got 95 percent accuracy on that. 95 <laughs> is still really good when you're blind. Yeah, right. I love PWG became kind of an end thing to do in Southern California. Talk about that, how that all developed. You know, we, we started out, we were really inspired. There was a, a tournament in 2001 called the King of Indies, all pro wrestling in, in San Francisco put it on. And it was basically the American independent version of the Super J Cup tournament. And we saw that and we saw all these guys come together, have this, these great matches over the course of a weekend. And said, wouldn't that be cool if we were able to do that? And so that was kind of the first uh, mission statement, I guess, of, of PWG was to just get all the best indie guys from, you know, not only Southern California, but around the country, get them together and just put on great shows. And, yeah. you know, it took a couple of years of, of us doing that before we really got noticed. And I think the, the thing that did get us noticed was on a global scale was we had the Battle of Los Angeles tournament. And, and I believe it was... 2006 was the first time that the Dragon Gate guys came over from Japan. And after that, after they got to wrestle with a lot of the, the North American indie guys, they said, hey, you guys are pretty good. Would you like to come over to Japan for a tour? And so that was when Kevin Steen, El Generico, Chris Bosch, and I believe B-Boy maybe all went over for Dragon Gate. And from then it became within the American indie community, it was like, oh, this is a way to get booked in Japan if I can get on PWG. And so mm -hmm. it, it all kind of snowballed from there. Yeah, because to me, when I started watching indie wrestling, I've seen all these guys and there's the same like 
shitty room in Reseda, California that became like synonymous with like, these are the next big names in wrestling. Like PWG is essentially like when you've made it to PWG, you've made it in indie wrestling. That's how kind of I always saw it. And I don't know if you kind of ever saw it that way or like even understood like what it meant to be running a promotion that was that highly regarded. When you're so inside of it, you kind of fail to notice what the outside perception is. And so there was, there was a time, uh, when Desmond Xavier, when he first came to, to PWG, we were still, we were still in Reseda and it had rained for, I don't know, about three weeks in Southern California, which in Southern California, that's a big deal. And the leak or the roof of the, the Legion hall in Reseda was leaking. It, the whole building smelled like mildew. It just, it was in its worst state that it had ever been in. And Des walks in and he's just wide eyed and he comes in and he just gasps. He's like, I can't believe I'm finally here. And I'm like, in, in this <laughs> dump, like you're yeah. going to get black mold, you know, like you're going to get black lung just by being in here. It's like, I don't <laughs> care. It's awesome. And you know, it's like when, when people had that kind of reaction coming into the building, you know, that, that was when I kind of felt that, you know, we had something really special and, you know, like I talked about the, the Dragon Gate guys coming over that the, the kind of second wave of that was in, I believe 2012 was the first time that Steve Regal came to a uh, battle of Los Angeles tournament. And shortly after that, I mean, you could just see every, every year that he would come out to battle of Los Angeles, there would be two or three or four or five guys that shortly thereafter would get signed to NXT. And so that also kind of is what gave PWG the reputation of, you know, being the place to, to be found. Right. To be found. But, but there was more than just that Excalibur uh, celebrities came too, right. And it was, it was a big deal for celebrities to get in uh, and have their picture taken. I was told that at the ringside that they were there. I mean, it was a big deal, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was, you know, the, the great thing about pro wrestling gorilla is that it was kept intentionally small and it still is, you know, it's, there's a finite amount of tickets. There's no real preferential treatment to, you know, if, uh, if, you know, a celebrity emails us and asks and says, Hey, can I get a ticket? The answer is more, more often than not. No. And Here's so, the ticket link. yeah. <laughs> and so that was kind of what made it really, really sought after in some circles. And the first celebrity that we, we really had come to the show was this guy named Chris Bauer, who is an actor that's been on many of the David Simon HBO shows. He's been on the wire. He's been on, um, Oh shit. The one that was just, uh, the one that just ended about about New York in the seventies. Uh, Hunters. No, no. Uh, I know that's your favorite. Your favorite show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, no, but the, and and so he was on a show called True Blood on HBO, and so he would come right. and he would bring some of his friends from the show. He he would tell them about it, and then for the the rap party for True Blood, his gift to the cast was that he bought out an entire section at one of our shows. And so Joe uh, Manganiello was on true blood and that, and that's when he first started dating Sophia Vergara. And that's when she came and got her picture taken with, uh, that was when we had like a big, big angle with, uh, the, the young bucks, Roderick strong, Adam Cole and <laughs> super dragon lying, laying waste to the entire roster. And so Sophia Vergara has this selfie where she's like posing next to the ring. And she says like, I think they're dead. And I am the, the corpse laying immediately behind her. That's That was my big claim to fame for the longest time. But, you know, around that time, we, we, we had musicians come. Billy Corrigan, before, uh, you know, he got involved in wrestling, came to check us out. Adam Jones from, from Tool was always a big supporter of ours, and he would bring other musicians. One of the biggest things for me was Mike Patton from Faith No More, Tomahawk, Mr. Bungle, all, the, all those great bands. He came to one of our shows, and the, the great thing about the PWG audience is that they're there to see the wrestling. They're not there to see the, the celebrities. And so, you know, a couple people will go up and say hi and just, you know, talk to people, but for the most part, are very respectful and uh, just really cool about, uh, you know, having a good familial atmosphere that we're all here to see the wrestling. You know, the just who happens to be here is kind of secondary. I think my favorite part, at, like a weird thing that happened in Battle of Los Angeles this last year is the first day there was Mara Wilson in the crowd who mm -hmm. did uh, Matilda. And like, I didn't know it, but then Jeff Cobb comes downstairs. He's like, dude, Matilda's in the crowd. And he like has this look on his face. Like he just woke up and it's Christmas. And he's like, I used to watch that movie all the time. And you see like Brody King come by like, 
wait, Matilda's here? And they're apparently like both the biggest Matilda marks. So like during intermission, there's guys like sitting next to the wrestlers and taking pictures. And then Jeff Cobb's like, hey, hey, Matilda, can I get a picture? And it's just so, so funny seeing these like big, scary giant guys asking this like girl who's just there to watch wrestling. And she's like, yeah, sure, I guess. Like it was just a very, very funny picture, but awesome at the same time. Fun story. <laughs> All right. Uh, we want to talk to uh, Excalibur about his transition uh, from a wrestler to an announcer and how that has blossomed into a great career for him. And uh, also want to talk about his fandom as well. This is AEW Unrestricted. Today we've got Excalibur. We've been talking a little bit about PWG, about his time as a wrestler, what got him into wrestling, all these awesome things. But eventually, you know, you'd started announcing for PWG back the first show and then eventually turned into announcing full time. What was sort of the transition there? Um, My in-ring career came to an end and that was pretty much it. It was... You know, a combination of of injuries and I guess, uh, you know, kind of lack of motivation on my part. I felt like PWG was getting to a certain point where, you know, the, the level of wrestling on our shows was so high that I felt for, you know, a variety of reasons that I couldn't really keep up with that that level of wrestling and mostly due to you know, my, my knees were bad. My back was bad. Uh, you know, I'd had a couple of concussions that I was pretty worried about. And I knew that I, you know, by being part of, you know, the management of PWG, I could give myself a, a spot on the show if I wanted to. But right. I felt like that would have been unfair to the guys that were, you know, either the local Southern California guys or the guys coming from around the country that were really trying to make a career in professional wrestling. I knew that, being a pro wrestler was not going to be my long-term career. And so for me to take a spot away from somebody else that did have those aspirations, that felt to be a little selfish on my part. And so, you know, there's was, was a variety of factors, but that's what ended up leading to me, uh, you know, hanging up the trunks, but not the mask. And so, you know, as, as I transitioned to, um, Outside of the ring role, I was the uh, the commissioner of food and beverage for a long time. You know, the, the, the figurehead <laughs> as well as the announcer, and so you know, it was it was convenient to have you know a a figurehead mouthpiece person for us. If you know, like if uh, a guy missed his flight or his flight got canceled or something, or we had to sh- shuffle around the card, you know, we didn't really have anybody that could announce that. And so for me to be in that position, it kind of. It, that was helpful, but, you know, for my primary focus was the announcing. And and that was, you know, around the time that I started to take it a little more seriously as I noticed that, you know, guys were were going places based on what PWG was doing. And so it I felt it incumbent upon me to do a better job as an announcer if these guys are going out there busting their ass in the ring for us. And you just chose to keep the mask because you had been wearing it the whole time? Or was there another reason for that? Yeah, yeah, that was, I mean, Excalibur is the only thing I've ever been in professional wrestling. And, you know, even though it, it was on a very, very low level that, you know, to this day, people still don't understand why I wear the mask. It's the only, it's the only persona I've ever done in professional wrestling. And, and you know, for me, there is you know, kind of that, that separation. When I put on the mask, this is wrestling. When I take off the mask, this is everything else in my life. That's true. That's a really good point. Starting PWG, uh, wrestling, and then moving into the, the announcing side of it. Obviously, you loved wrestling growing up. Talk about your fandom. Talk about how you started, when you first started loving professional wrestling, when that started, and how it continued up until your professional career started. Well, you know, I, I touched on it a little bit before, you know, Hulk Hogan, Macho Man, those were my guys when I was a kid. And growing up in Detroit, having WrestleMania three in Detroit, that was a big kind of touchstone for everybody that, you know, all, when I was in school, everybody was talking about it for you know, the right. weeks leading up to it. And then the weeks after, and it's like, you know, the kids that got to go to WrestleMania, they were the lucky ones. The rest of us, you know, either have to watch it on you know, like closed circuit or, or wait for the 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 home video release and you know i mean there i I grew up in in the in the 80s and detroit historically is a big wrestling city and so you know those those combinations of of factors led to you know just me me being interested in it and you know i mentioned as you know i guess in the early 90s maybe 93 i kind of fell out of it but 
there was that ember burning, you know, in the in the back of my mind that all it took was just like a little bit of kindling, and that little bit of kindling that one was thing. yeah was was that you know seeing the the lucha libre style and and seeing these guys in masks flying around and that that just you know reignited everything and then turned it into a huge passion of mine to to the point where uh, I remember when I got my my first car on my lunch break in high school I would actually drive to a Japanese video store that was, I think they were only open to like, like 5 PM. And it was, it was, it was about 25 minutes away. And so I would drive there. I'd run over to the sports section. I learned what, you know, pro wrestling looked like in Japanese. And I would just go and I'd grab every tape off the shelf. I would rent it. And then I, you know, go home and I would record, I would I'd dub all the tapes. Then the next day, bring them back. <laughs> and I'd, I'd ask them like, when are you getting more? And they're like, I'm not getting more till next week. And I'd be like, okay. And then I'd come back the next week and I would do that. And, um, and so I, I really became fanatical about it to the point where my dad said, if you spent one tenth of the energy you do on pro wrestling on your schoolwork, you'd be a straight A student. <laughs> so your your dad is not too cool on wrestling? Is that what you're saying? Um, he He's come around to it. He's uh, He watches, okay. he well, watches Dynamite pills, every week. Sure he's got s- sartorial criticisms for me, uh, you know, about about my suit, about my, uh, my tie, everything. He, he watches Dark. He watches all, all this stuff. And he's, he's come around to, to it now. But, you know, I mean... The thing that 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 kind of caused a rift between my dad and I was that I I left Detroit in 1999 to move all the way to Los Angeles with twenty two thousand dollars in my pocket, and it was to pursue my passion of pro wrestling. And you know, so I, I quit school, I did that, and he's he's just like, "This is a terrible idea. I don't like this. I don't agree with this." <laughs> and so so things were rough between us for a couple of years. But then after I was in LA for a while. And I kind of, you know, set up my own life out there. And, you know, I, I threw, I, I, you know, I give myself this pat on the back. I never, I never Go asked ahead. him for a handout. I never asked him for, for money. I kind of did it, did it all on my own. And yeah. I think he respected that. And after a while, you know, I think after I retired and I was, you know, retired from wrestling, but was still involved in PWG on the, you know, the, the other aspects of it, he came around to it. You know, he saw that there was, you know, he could Google it and find find stuff about it and find that it was not just this insignificant little organization out there, that there were people around the world talking about it. And so, over, you know, over time, he, you know, began to, uh, you know, he, he began to come around and now he's, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to think that he, he would watch Dynamite without me, but I think I'm a big part of it. But actually, on the last couple of weeks, Tony, where it's only been you, he's like, hey, uh, Tony and Jericho are doing a pretty good job. Are you worried? Oh. I'm like, hey, dad, go after yourself. Oh, did you ask him if he's watching the post show? Uh, he did watch the post show last week. He, he's asking me about. Uh, he's he's like, hey, Taz and Jr. Like Ozark. How come you haven't watched it yet? <laughs> wow. Yeah, how come you haven't watched it yet? Because I don't have my AARP card, Tony. <laughs> hey, <Hey-o. laughs> uh, tell your dad that we are all a team, okay? <laughs> and the only reason Jericho and I are doing all the shows now is because. Of the virus, I know he know, and uh, and he was actually very thankful. Uh, Aubrey, there, uh, you know, when when we're at shows, I will routinely iron my my own shirt and jacket and stuff. And every time I'm doing that, Sandra has a billion other things to be doing instead of ironing my clothes. She's got. A and lot. every time I do that, Tony Tony walks by and he'll be like, "Your parents raised you right." And uh, <laughs> and I, I told my dad that because, you know, like I, when I was watching Nitro, you know, I was still at his house. I'd be watching Nitro and, he, you know, he, it would be on and he would see it. So, of course, he knows who Tony Schiavone is. And so I'd be like, Dad, Tony Schiavone told me you did a good job raising me. And he's like, Ooh. that means a lot. So, yeah, well, good. That's awesome. Good, good. You, uh, as an announcer, and, and of course, we're going to be talking about uh, your transition to AEW. But you as an announcer, and, and uh, here's a, a little behind the scenes thing as well. When I found out that I was going to be doing one with Cody and Kenny Omega, mm-hmm. the first one by myself, which is kind of the first play by play, I was really nervous. And I, I don't get nervous. Never been nervous. I don't know if nervous is the right word. It's concern. And I sent you a text and I said, you need to help me out with naming these moves because you're so good at it. And I just so want to make sure- good. I'm just going to make sure that I'm on top of things. And I found out quickly, whoo, I'm not. Uh, but uh, how did you learn all this? Just studying and watching tapes and just by doing it, it it's absolutely amazing. I mean, everything, it used to not be, Excalibur, as you know, it used to not be that everything had a name. 
but it seems like everything's got a name now and most of the names work out quite well. Yeah. It, like I said, during, uh, during my high school days when I was dedicating a lot of time to wrestling, I was, you know, I was watching the, the Japanese tapes. And after a while I figured out, it's like, oh, they're actually saying English words, just kind of like an accent to Japanese. And, you know, I would start right. to break down what, what those words were. And the other thing that really kind of pushed me in that uh, wrestling nerd direction was there was this game that came out for Sega Saturn called Fire Pro Wrestling S Six Men Scramble. And it was, there's this legendary series of video games called Fire Pro Wrestling, which started out on the uh, Super Nintendo and then kind of w went through different iterations. But this was the first one that came out during the early internet age. And I was super, super into this game and actually helped work on the, the FAQ, like the translation, the fan translation of this game. And so that really provided me like the foundation of knowledge of, of wrestling moves is because I would, you know, I'd be working with people that were translating the, and this is all, all fan driven stuff. And we, we'd all be working on translations together. This was way before Google translate. You know, if you had like a Japanese friend, you would, you would ask them or their parents or something to, to translate one specific phrase or move or thing like that. And that's, you know, through through working on that type of project, that's what provided me this foundational knowledge. And then just throughout the years of watching watching wrestling and building upon it and just, I don't know, making mental notes uh, about what things are calling. And, you know, having been involved in, in Pro Wrestling Gorilla for so long, you know, I, the, the first Kenny Omega match I called was in 2007 or 2008. And so... I've been very closely, you know, monitoring his, his in-ring career and, you know, making mental notes about these moves or, you know, he would give me, he'd be like, Hey, I'm going to do, you know, I've got this, this finisher that I want to, I'm calling this. And so, you know, I've, I've got this, this bank, uh, this long running bank of knowledge where, you know, Tony, I think that the first Kenny Omega match you called was probably in 2019. Yes. And so, you know, if I, if I had to call a, uh, you know, Gwyneth Stripers game, you know, I might not have the ERA at hand, whereas you sure. might have that just, you know, rummaging around in the back of your head. You might have that. Right. Sure. I, I get it. I get it. Some of these names of these moves uh, that we hear you say, uh, and they, they throw off the tongue so easily, so effortlessly. Did you come up with some of these names? Not unless somebody specifically asked me, what should I call this? Everything that I, not everything, but, you know, I'd say 99% of the, the things that I call have been called that somewhere else, either by okay. the guy that came up with it, you know, like Kenny Omega's finisher, the one winged angel, that's right. the move that he named. But, you know, Tope Suicida, that is the, my the Spanish translation of, you know, suicide dive. Right, and, right. you know, then there's Tope Con Hero, which is uh, mistranslated to Japanese as Tope Con Hilo. Mm -hmm. Because Japanese people sometimes will transpose L's and R's. But Tope Con Hero is a dive with a flip or with a rotation or a, a gyro, you know, like right. think about it. And, that, and so a lot of it is just my, my wrestling Spanish is much more proficient than my, you know, my day-to-day -day conversational Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it, it's remarkable. Thank you. Is there anyone that's asked you to name their moves? Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of times, you know, guys will come up to me like, hey, I got an idea for a thing. So, you know, if you if you see me do it, just name it something cool. And I'll be like, uh, you're not giving me a lot of notice here. <laughs> you know, like, you know, actually during uh, PAC and Omega at All Out, Tony Khan, one of the few times that he gets in my ear, he got in my ear and he's like, he's like, uh, hey, think of a name for PAC's finisher. And this was 30 seconds before it happened. <laughs> oh, God. No pressure. Yeah. And so that's, I just blurted out Brutalizer. So that was one that I named. But, oh, very good. Uh, thank you. Uh, it, but it was, it was just on the spot and something that I, I, I had to come up with. Well, I got, I got one more for you. Uh, the first day that I had to do the, uh, the commentary alone when we were in Jacksonville, Sammy Guevara was going to win a match. And I said, what's the name of your finish called? He said, I don't know. I haven't come oh up with God, a name. Oh my God, I remember that. I haven't come up with a name yet. I went, okay. I said, you need to call Excalibur. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe, you got, maybe you'll have to name another one. We'll see. Anyway, 
Uh, we're talking with Excalibur, and uh, next we're going to hear about Excalibur's transition to work for All Elite Wrestling. We're here, AEW Unrestricted, official podcast of AEW, talking to Excalibur. I'm Aubrey Edwards. We've got Tony Schiavone. Talked a little bit about time on the indies, starting PWG, going from wrestling to announcing. Lots of fun stuff, how you got into wrestling. But now you're here, AEW, a very integral part of AEW day-to-day, Wednesdays, announce team, all these things. How did that all start? Like, When was the first time you heard about AEW? Well, it, it kind of the the impetus for this was all in, and in uh, September of 2018, and the Bucks were putting together the the show along with Cody and Kenny, and uh, and they they asked me to be a part of the announce team, and that was the first time that I had ever done anything on pay per view, anything that was actually broadcast around. I guess live sh- I've done live stream stuff, but you know, like that that level of something and big it was the first time i'd ever worked with don Callis and ian riccoboni and i think for you know just sitting you know meeting that afternoon sitting down and, and calling a show together i think we did really well and after the show was over matt jackson came up to me and he said hey um we've got something in the works just uh you know keep your uh you know keep your ears open you know uh, uh, we will we'll we'll be in touch and i said yeah okay sure and you know i i had no idea <laughs> what was really happening and then you know i saw them a month or so later and they were like hey you know things are things are happening we're we're really working on something here you know just kind of you know keep it keep an open mind and then you know january 1st 2019 the big announcement on being the elite AEW is formed, and I said, oh, wow, this is actually happening, and it seems to be happening in a, in a very big way. And so they uh, they asked me to do the, uh, the the ticket on sale press conference in, in Las Vegas in February, and they said, hey, how would you feel about announcing the show? And I said, I'd love it. And they said, how would you feel about announcing the show with Jim Ross? And I said, you're absolutely out of your minds. That will never happen in a million years. And they said, yes, it, this is, <laughs> this is the team. And so I said, yes, I'd, I'd love to do that. And so they, uh, along with Alex Marvez, they flew us to, to Atlanta and we did some, some chemistry tests with JR. And, you know, at first he was very skeptical. He saw, he saw me in the mask and he said, what mm-hmm. the hell is this? Why? Exactly. Yeah. Why, why, <laughs> why, are, why are you doing this? You know, you know the announcer's job is to um, is to put over the product in the ring and not themselves. And I said, Jr., I, I I know and I I hope that I can earn your trust. And you know I I hope you can see the the job that I do is all about you know promoting the in ring product. And he said, oh, we'll, we'll, you know we'll see. And so we called a we called a, f- a few hours of matches that were that were on tape. And initially he said, I'm going to do lead play by play. You know, Excalibur, you do analysis. Marvez, you do, uh, you know, you do color like uh, statistics or whatever. And he said, okay. And then slowly, after, you know, after we'd done a couple matches, things started shifting to me going into the more play by play role. JR doing some color, Marvez doing the analysis or, you know, statistics, things like that. And, you know, depending on the type of match, we would kind of shift roles back and forth. Where, And I think that's ultimately the the formula that that we've adopted for AEW is that on certain types of matches that are more traditional style pro wrestling, JR takes the lead and on matches that are more, you know, fast paced, I guess, you know, 2010s or in this case, 2020s professional wrestling style, I'll, I'll take the lead on that. And it's not something that Tony, and you can attest to this that we've ever discussed. It's just right. something that that's kind of happened organically. That's yeah. cool. Uh, JR mentioned one time that one of the fans, I guess it was on Twitter, said, uh, why do you let uh, Excalibur do play-by-play, JR? JR says, because he's good at it. (laughs) Uh, And so that's how we work, as I think, as a team. Excalibur takes the lead, JR takes the lead, and I say, you're right, Excalibur, (laughs) you're right, JR, and run away with a paycheck, basically. It's okay. Tony just rides everyone's coattails. That's that, no, listen. I like that, buddy. Tony, I like that. Buddy. Tony Schiavone is the the highest paid member per syllable of the the AEW announced team. <laughs> That's exactly right. I heard that once. JR. I was like, how do I get that deal? <laughs> no, uh, one. Uh, I think it was after. 
I think it was actually after Fight for the Phone in Jacksonville uh, last July. JR paid a very, very big compliment to me, which uh, I was very surprised by and still still very memorable. He said, you know why I like working with you? Because it's a night off for me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> JR is one of the most like honest people and yeah, I absolutely okay. love that about him. He's just yeah. like, Oh yeah, here's how it is. Yeah. And, yeah. and but, right, you know, to, to have him say that and, you know, to know that, that, you know, despite his early skepticism that, you know, then over the course of three shows, he had kind of come to trust my, That's my right. it was our, literally our third show and, and knowledge. And then, you know, when, when we took that break over Christmas and came back January 1st, it felt very good to sit down with JR and Tony and just to, to be back in the saddle. And, you know, like that one week break, I don't, I don't think we, either, any of us felt like we missed a beat. And just cause we're, you know, we're, we're all very good at the type of commentary that we do. And so if JR does D JR stuff, Excalibur does Excalibur stuff and Tony does Tony stuff, we're going to be just fine. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I agree with all that. I, I really think that, on a personal note, I, I just think uh, working with Jr. again for me is a big treat because we hadn't done it since really the early 90s. And being able to work with you and actually learning a lot from you has made it a great broadcast as well. So Yeah, I, I mean, you know, for, for me as well, it's Jr. and more specifically Tony, because I was always a Nitro guy are, you know, the voices of, you know, that those formative wrestling years for me. And so I, I would always watch watch Nitro live and, and raw on tape. And so, you know, as cool as it is to get to work with JR, it was almost a, a bigger thrill to be able to work with Tony. So it's uh, this has been very special and very rewarding for me. And I can't wait until we get to get back to it. You guys are adorable. This this is great. And we always put over the referees, too. That's true. So. Shut up. Shut up. <laughs> You do, you do. It's actually like, that's one of the things I really like about our announce team is they're invested in literally every single talent that's in the ring. Sure, you gotta be. The other thing I, I try to do too is, I mean, it's not not just, you know, mentioning the referee by name, but but also giving the referees something of, of personalities. Like, you know, we have our our multi-man match specialist in, in Rick, Rick Knox. Knox. You know, mm -hmm. our, the, our title match specialist is either Aubrey or Paul Turner. You know, I mean, there's different different referees fit different roles and if you think mm -hmm. about you know basketball or football you have you know like the sideline official the the, the lead official the, these things and so of course it makes sense for the referee corps in AEW to have different specialties i mean it gives it kind of that more sports like product mm -hmm. right like a, a fight in mma might be stopped earlier by one ref than it would another it's like the ref has as much impact on the finish as anything else so yeah, it's kind of sure. nice that like you guys recognize that and actually help because it's like we're all building the product together so you're doing the uh, aw post show with jr and taz now during this uh, very extraordinary time for all of us uh how you liking that it's great i mean obviously it's it'd be better if we were all sitting in the same room together but you know it's like i mean just like this is it's a it's a chance for me to get talk to my friends who I haven't seen in a, in a long time. Sure. And uh, so in, in that instance, it's, it's great, you know, having, having Taz and JR. And for, for me, it's, it's kind of a different role too, because, you know, I, I talked in, on other interviews or podcasts about how much I've learned from JR and Tony and how it's, you know, cause I can, you know, I can do play by play for a fast paced wrestling match in my sleep, but throwing to break or doing a live read for, you know, upcoming ticket sales or something. These are things that I've never had to worry about in Pro Wrestling mm -hmm. Gorilla, but they're things that JR and Tony can do in their sleep. And so I've learned a lot about that aspect of the job from them. And, you know, doing the, doing the post show with JR and Taz, it's given me a whole other thing where I'm almost kind of like the host of the show. And I'm just teeing those guys up for questions. And so that's been really interesting and really fun because, you know, I'll have my thoughts about, you know, something that, that we saw in Dynamite. But I can ask JR and then I can ask Taz, what were your thoughts about it? And then we can see how they all, all line up together. And, you know, sometimes we all have the same thought, but then other times we see it from completely different perspectives. And it's been really cool and really re rewarding. What's uh What's been your favorite match to call at AEW so far? Um. It's tough. Uh, there's or do you have any that are like specifically memorable? Yeah, the 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 Bucks Lucha Bros ladder match that was kind of <sighs> the the culmination of 
you know, the, the young bucks that, uh, you know, I began calling them and, you know, I, f- I first met them in 2004. Uh, I first met Matt and then start first started calling them in 2006, I think. And so to see that match be kind of like the, the culmination of their, their indie career had now led to this point. And I, I know they had, you know, they had gone to new Japan they'd done stuff there and that's, that's that's great, but you know, there's something that felt very special about them wrestling the Lucha Brothers in a ladder match because that same type of match could have happened in PWG. You know, like if the Young Bucks wrestled Rocky Romero and Rusuke Taguchi, that wouldn't necessarily feel like a PWG match, but them wrestling the Lucha Bros in a ladder match felt very PWG to me, and so that was special. And then another match that was really special was when Scorpio Sky wrestled Chris Jericho because Sky is another guy mm-hmm. that I've known for 18 years and I was there from the very first stages of his career when he first started training in Southern California and then to see him wrestle a main event match on you know national television against one of the best in the world was for a title. so yeah yeah it was just so fulfilling to me and and, and you know I mean that's PWG it was never about being the biggest promotion in the world. It was, it, it started out as being like a, a place for us to do cool wrestling. And then it kind of be transformed over the years into a place where this is kind of like a way station. This is where you stop before you go out into the bigger world and onto the bigger thing. And so, you know, seeing so many guys, whether they're in WWE or AEW or Japan or wherever that have, have gone through PWG, that's very rewarding. And then, to be able to call one of those matches with our then at the time world champion Chris Jericho, a guy that I you know have an immense level of fandom for, and Scorpio Sky, a guy that I've known for nearly twenty years, that was so rewarding and so meaningful for me. That's so awesome. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, what about the uh, Dusty Cody match or the Dustin Cody match during Double or Nothing? That was very emotional, just because it was too brothers beating the shit out of each other you know sure, and there sure. was there was so much you know so much obviously history between the two brothers but you know so many so much history in terms of what dusty had done for pro wrestling and right. you know for his two sons to be blazing their own their own trail here in AEW you know much much like he was able to do in the, you know in the south and florida and everywhere that's it, that was that was so rewarding but you know that was a match where, you know, I let JR take the lead on it. Not not that I let him. JR would have taken the lead no matter what. I got that. I Let's got be that. real. But, be real. Um, but, you know, I knew just instinctually that this is a JR match. This, sure. this needs the JR touch of storytelling. And so that was really special because to be able to sit there for, A, such a great match between Dustin and Cody, and B, such a great call. I mean, literally a master class from JR in how to call that type of wrestling match. And I got to sit there, you know, elbow to elbow with him. That was an unbelievable experience. And that was on the, the very first AEW show. Yeah. Send the bar kind of high. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So now we're in the, in the era where it, and you've, you did a little bit of it, uh, calling matches without an audience and you've seen matches without an audience. What's your reaction to all this? It's tough. Um, because there's, there's so many times where, you know, as, as broadcasters, we'll, we'll lay out for the swell of the crowd or, you know, things like that. And with, without that, it's, it's a lot of silence and that's a little tough because it, you know, it requires, uh, it requires a shift in, in your, your instincts because, you know, as when, when you hear the crowd starting to, to get ready to erupt, you're, hey, you hey, you yeah, you, you want to hey, lay out and you, you want to let them be heard. But without that there, you kind of have to fill fill that space. And, you know, there is a is a time and place for for silences. But, you know, it's I think we end up speaking more on these these empty arena shows than than we would on an on an average dynamite broadcast. And for the past few years at Pro Wrestling Girl, I've called things by myself. And so I you know, I have nobody to play off of. And one of one of the things that that Jr. has uh, has chided me on is that uh, we, we don't get paid by the word, kid. <laughs> right. and, you know, so unless you're Tony Schiavone, right? Then get paid by the <laughs> but 
so so in these empty arena matches, it's I, I think having having my my more, more verbose tendencies of speaking more does kind of help because then you can kind of fill in those those what would be silences. One thing with uh, Tony Khan, he is as as you know, Excalibur, he is not. Although he can be in our ear and has been in our ear at times, he's not one to uh, overcoach us or overdrive us. He lets us do our thing, which certainly we all appreciate. But during these, uh, I-, I found out during the last couple of weeks, uh, during the empty arena matches, he kind of stays on me, coaches me, and tells us, you know, we have no fans, so you're going to need to talk a lot more. <laughs> and so uh, he lets us know that. So, yeah, it's a change. So, uh, listen – uh, during this time where uh, no one can get out, and uh, or should get out, uh, what should is your uh, what is your uh, binge watching recommendations during hashtag Stay Home? Um, whew, there's I've been watching watching Westworld wrestling, on HBO. wrestling tapes. <laughs> no, <laughs> okay. You know what? I'm sorry. What are you watching? Uh, watching Westworld on HBO. I've been watching uh, Better Call Saul, which yeah. is mm. phenomenal. Getting through season two of Narcos Mexico, and actually, for a, a little-known show that everybody should watch, and, the, and I hopefully our, our Turner Media or Warner Media family would be very happy in me promoting. But I am promoting through no duress. You know, there's no gun off camera pointed to my head. This is one of the best comedy shows of the last probably ten years. There's wow. two seasons of it. The episodes are ten to fifteen minutes each, and it is perfect in every way it's on adult swim it's called joe para talks with you Ooh, and I'm sold. it's so easily digestible so funny so wholesome it is so great and i cannot give enough love to that show joe para talks with you joe para talks with you we'll write it down as a matter write it of fact. down making a note yeah hey so whatever happened to your extensive wrestling uh collection all the dubs you made um it is still in my dad's basement uh, <laughs> every time I go for a visit, he'll ask me, he's like, Hey, can I get rid of these? And I was like, ah, maybe just hold on to them for a little longer. And, uh, yeah, I, I hope he doesn't throw them out, but I have not had a VCR plugged into my television in probably 18 years. And so if he did throw them out, he could, he could replace them all with blank tapes or just, uh, empty boxes. And I probably wouldn't even know. <laughs> Well, I tell you, Dad's got to be really proud of you. He really does because you've done a phenomenal job. Even though he can tell people, that's my son. They say, how do you know he's got a mask on? He can still say that <laughs> to everybody out there. And he has to be proud of you. It's a great story. Well, yeah, thank you. And uh, and I'll have you know, Tony, that he wears a mask to the golf course. <laughs> <laughs> As well he should. As well he should in honor of his son. Excalibur, thanks a lot, buddy. Always great talking to you. Thanks so much for being here, Dave. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Aubrey. Really great pleasure to be here. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks, Excalibur. Uh, don't forget, Aubrey. Whoa, whoa, what? Huh? Subscribe to what? Subscribe to AEW Unrestricted. I think you can get it for, for free. That's right. Wherever you get your podcasts. We're free wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. Uh, we got new audio episodes every Thursday morning, the day after AEW Dynamite is on TV. 8 o'clock Eastern, 7 Central on TNT. I'm Aubrey Edwards. I'm Tony Schiavone. Down here in that frame, or that frame, depending on how this is recorded. But yeah, this is AEW Unrestricted. Thanks again for listening. Thank you, Excalibur. This has been awesome. Thanks, guys.